a little older, a little wiser. Berkey, how are you? Good, Kipper. How are you? We're well. We're well. Um, have you spoken to anybody since uh, you left Pittsburgh or, you know, what have you been up to? I, everybody anticipated we'd see you on TV right away. Um, my, my good buddy here, Justin, says that still may happen with the NHL Network. Just maybe talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the last uh, few weeks, a month. Well, the answer is I've talked to uh, Hexy and uh, talked to a couple of people who work for the Penguins, but mostly been uh, incommunicado. Uh, moved back to Ontario, and I'm just trying to uh, – I had a knee replacement, and I'm trying to get the other one scheduled, and that's going to be in Pittsburgh, and we're keeping our place there for now. But, uh, yeah, no, just uh, – I don't know if I'm going back on TV or not. We'll have to see. I did a couple of days at the NHL Network. Really enjoyed that. I don't know if there's other opportunities there or Sportsnet or anywhere else at this point. Well, we would certainly love to see you around here, Berkey. Thanks for joining us today. Um, wanted to get your, I guess, just hear a little bit about how things unfolded there in Pittsburgh once that new ownership group came in for you there. Um, you know, did you feel things change as the new ownership took over? Did that affect things for you there? Well, first off, Justin, thanks for having me on. I didn't mean to ignore you. I didn't know who was on. I, oh, I called one. you Jason Bourne. <laughs> I called you Jason Bourne a couple yeah. of days ago. Oh, boy. Um, anyway, thanks for having me on. Um, no, um, what happened? Well, I mean, the team got sold. That's the third time that's happened to me, where a team was sold and I was fired and, you know, some relatively, in one case, days, one case, months, one case, uh close to a year, I guess, after the team was bought. So I think we knew right away we're at risk when, a, when an ownership group comes in. And I want everyone clear on this. I said the same thing in Toronto when they get fired. The owners have the right to have whomever they'd like run the team. Right. Like you, The fact that the team got sold doesn't mean it's guaranteed you're going to get terminated, but there's a good chance. And that's they bought the team. They spent that money. They're entitled to have the people they want run it. So there's no issue from our standpoint that uh, – a change was made, and it's kind of expected in a lot of cases, but um, no hard feelings that way. It's just we had hoped that if we had some success, we'd be able to prolong our stays there, but it didn't happen. Hey, Berkey, there's obviously a lot of narratives coming out of Toronto lately from pro-Kyle or pro-Brendan, uh, but the one thing about Kyle is the stories out there that – he didn't get to do things as fast as he would have liked or uh, he needed more power or uh, the ability to make decisions quicker. C can you speak of th the difference between maybe just one owner? Like I know you had the Samuelis in, in Anaheim or if you've got, you know, a complex uh, company l like MLSE with so many divisions or the Fenway group and how that might have affected Kyle or, or anyone else in that position? Well, I don't know specifics on how they reported. I know with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment, it was pretty simple. We did have a board, and we met once a year with the board. But basically, I told Richard Petty what I thought we should do. He might say, well, think about this, think about that. But basically, he was the conduit to ownership right up until the team got sold. So... It was simple when I got there. It was a little more complicated after that. Um, here, you know, like the, from my perspective, uh, I don't know. I like both guys immensely. I think Kyle's a really good guy, and I know Shani's a really good guy. Um, it sounds to me, just reading this from afar and not having any inside knowledge, but it seems to me that you had a process they were going through and they were moving toward an extension. That much was clear. But at least uh, right up until two or three days before, they had had extensive discussions with Kyle's agent and with Shani. So they were moving toward an agreement. And then it went off the rails. I forget what days, you know, Thursday, Friday, whatever. But Kyle met with the media and uh, became, a, he was clear that, look, I may not be back. And I think that was the first time, according to Shani, that's the first time he confronted that fact is, Hey, we might be looking for a new GM. And I think right there the math changes. If you're if you're a, a team president, right there the math changes. If one of the guys that you work for, that he works for you, is your right hand man, the most important guy in the organization, has just told you, I'm not sure I want to come back. 
So that was, I think, the first fly in the ointment, if you will. And then it went on, and they said they made they exchanged proposals, and that put two new things on the table. One is new, you know, terms of uh, employment in terms of money, apparently, and the second is you know, a new reporting scheme. So somehow streamline the reporting or make it easier or somehow, but affect the balance of power. Now, I will tell you from experience, if you're in the last year of your contract and you just got beaten in a playoff series that everyone expected you would win, and you want to discuss that after you've had lengthy discussions framing these issues, you want to put two new issues on the table. Oh, but by the way, I know we've gone down the road a long ways, but I want to talk about power and I want to talk about money. That's really a problem. That's a huge problem. And it's a problem, even if it's not a problem for Shani, which it would be, it would be a problem for your owners. So then it sounds like some of this is just, um, you know, a bit of a power struggle. Everyone's been talking about succession. That show, this seems something similar there where, you know, battling for the, the top spot. Do you feel that there's any chance Kyle, something changed with Kyle, like maybe he knew Pittsburgh may be an option for him, and that changes the way he approaches MLSE, or um, is this just getting you know too too greedy, really? Well, that would be tampering. No Justin. one would do no that, one in our league ever. <laughs> no. no one in our league ever tampers. No. That would be tampering. <laughs> right, right. Sorry. Sorry for the implication. No, I, 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 actually, I actually, in this case, I would say, um, tampering might be an issue. I don't think so. Not with Kyle. I think Kyle's too honest. I really mean that. I think he would have gone into this and said straight away, I'm doing this. I'm not he even said, I'm not going to go somewhere else. Um, he's too honest. So I think, no, I think it was a good faith. I need to clear up these two issues. They were problematic and, uh, blew up, but I don't think it was necessarily another suitor. Berkey, do you think that it is a possibility that Kyle may have lost deals because of the red tape. That that would be really speculative on my part, Kipper. Yeah. The answer would be everything I've talked about so far has been pretty clear that people have stated it. You're easy easy to draw a conclusion from it. But I'm not a I'm not going to speculate and say, well, I, that might have happened. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, you know the. You know, if indeed Kyle does end up in Pittsburgh, you might have some unique insight to the challenges that would face him this off season. Um, you know, if he is, does end up there, what is he walking into for decisions and uh, power structures and all that there? Well, I, the, the time that I worked with Fenway, I, I found them to be forthright and honest and, and good guys. I had no issues with them. Um, I think they made up their mind on us and where we were going. Uh, much of the reporting since we got fired has been disturbing. Uh, there, there's been a real concerted effort on ownership or coaching staff or both to uh, tell this narrative a certain way. And I'm not going to engage in telling the other side of that story because that's just silly in my mind. One, I could say, well, what about this? What about that? That's just silly. and I'm not interested in that. But that narrative has changed. But as far as the my, my time working for them, I enjoyed working for Fenway. Berkey, there, there's going to be a new general manager, and uh, you know you're someone that's lived it here in Toronto. And what advice would you give that new guy about this market compared to any other? Is it just uh, is it just wrong of, of him to come in here and think, hey, a job's a job? What's so different about here and the challenges? Well, you, you're talking, this sound like cliches, but you can dig up my uh, the comments from my press conference when I was announced in Toronto. And I, I as I told you, it's the Vatican. It's not just any other job. It's the New York Yankees. It's in Toronto. We all went to some remote village in South America and sat on the rock, on the stone wall outside and watched as, as people walked from remote areas. You'd see the first... Five things you would see for summer, like a hat or a T-shirt or a blap, would be Toronto Maple Leafs, Dallas Cowboys, New York Yankees, Boston Celtics, and then, I don't know, some Man U or someone else, right? Yeah. Some other thing that's popular globally. 
But you're talking a global brand. You're talking a famous, famous, like, like totally renowned across the globe. I remember after we won the Cup in Anaheim, we opened the season in London, England. And uh, I went to the O2 Arena just to, to watch. I, I stood in the crowd and watched people walk in. And I would guess, and no one knew who I was. It was great. But I would I would watch, and I would estimate there were 2,000 sweaters. Teams had NHL sweaters on. And out of that number, probably half of them, at least 1,000, but maybe half, were Toronto Maple Leaf sweaters. <laughs> and then the other common ones, like, Montreal's common, Boston's common and popular. They're both real popular brands. But Toronto dominated, and we weren't playing. It was Anaheim versus L.A. It wasn't a Leafs game. There were 1,000 to 2,000 Leafs sweaters there. I've never seen anything like it in my life. The year we had that game at the big house, before I got fired, Gary Bettman called me and said, we're going to have a problem selling tickets in Detroit. Can you sell 40,000 tickets in in Detroit for the Toronto Maple Leafs? I said, Gary? I'll need 48 hours. <laughs> call me back about a week. Call me back about a week later and say, "What about 60,000?" I said, "Well, I need 72 hours." We had ticket requests from 32 countries. You know how many people are going to fight to get that job? Yeah. You're going to have a first aid ward with people battered and bruised trying to get that job. So yeah, it's special. Now, is it difficult? Is it pressure filled? Was I able to get it done there? No, I wasn't. But I would still tell anyone it's a special place to work. I loved, and Nikki knows this, I loved my time in Toronto. I loved it. Even though I didn't have any success with my team, even though it got difficult at the end, I loved it all. Well, it is such a, you know, a coveted position now, and, like, the biggest names that are out there are being tied to the job. You know, whoever it is is going to take this job, and it's not like when someone can come in and say, I'm going to rebuild this thing. I need some time to assess. We're going to tear it down. we got five years. Like, they may have to do something significant immediately. Where do you sit on the idea that the core that's been here that hasn't gone where people expected them to needs to get broken up? Well, again, I'm not, it wouldn't be tampering for me to talk about it now because I'm right. not employed by a team. But I would say this I've been very open in real time during my time at Sportsnet about the big, the Fab Four, the Big Four, whatever and the contracts they were given at that time. I called it out in real time, Justin. You'll remember that, yep. Nikki. You'll remember it. Yep. I said it was a mistake, the sequence they signed them, the amounts they paid them, the no trades, the terms. I went after all of that every bit as it happened. Again, it's real simple. When things don't work out, it's real simple to say, I told you, I told you, a lot of people didn't. I said it in real time. So, yeah, I think there's some real question marks about what they, how they put this together. What they do next, there's some time frames that kick in now. That's new. So new you know, contract uh, trade limits and what you can do and what you can't do all kick in. So it changes the timing of the new guy, but it doesn't change the difficulty of the job. This job is flat out hard. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of hard decisions to be made. You're capped out. You're a Canadian team, Canadian taxes. It's hard, but it can be done. And someone's going to figure it out there and they're going to have a great time. Do you really think it can be done? Is it even fair to ask someone to come in and assess this and think that uh, you can have all the answers before July 1st when some of those no trades kick in? No. You don't have to figure it all out, though. You just got to figure out two things. What are the two things? You got to figure out what Austin Matthews, if there's no trade, if you're happy with that. You got to figure out what to do with Mitch Marner. As far as the others, they could all wait. There's no deadline there in my mind. The, the list of 10 teams on Nylander, I think, kicks in. So what? Okay, so... You need to get a trade made. So Marner, the Marner decision will look after itself once you get the Matthews decision, do you not? Yes. So what's so complicated? Well, hold on. If he signs, if things. Matthews is resigning, then you think that's the decision you have to make is trade Marner? No, no, no. I'm saying that you probably have to trade Nylander or Marner at some point, but I think the pecking order would be that you would trade Nylander first out of that group. Yeah, it's a a source of much conversation here in Toronto. Just, you know, does it move the needle enough if you you move Nylander? But is is Tavares' contract excluded from this? Yeah, I don't think he's going anywhere. 
And I, I, I really believe when you get a no trade clause, that should be in good faith in general, mm-hmm. especially if you gave it to them. I didn't mind if there's no trade and I didn't give it to the player. We might have a discussion about waiving it. But in general, uh, if it's something I gave a guy, barring some catastrophe or real underperformance, and that's not happened here. Whether you like John Tavares as a player or not, he's kept his bargain here. He's worked his ass off. He's been yeah. a good player. He's a good guy. So there's no issue there. No, I think it's, it comes down to Nylander. And Nylander, by the way, is a guy that I've been critical of on TV. Um, I think he's had two back-to-back spectacular years. Yeah. So I think he's he's finally worth the money. I think it took a while. I think he's finally worth the money, and I think he's tradable. And then the last big decision would be there's still an employed coach, and Kip and I have kind of gone back and forth on this. I kind of feel like it's a strange position for Sheldon Keefe kind of waiting to get fired. Do you have any any issue with the way this is kind of playing out for the Leafs coach? Well, that's part of being a coach. That's the unfortunate side of this business is that this uh, a guy is going to have to wait out that decision and see what happens. And that's unfortunate. Like when a guy's hanging in the balance, the one merciful thing in Pittsburgh was we were fired on the spot the next morning. Yeah. But as far as, uh, as far as the, uh, you know, the, what happens next with the coach. Um, he certainly is winning percentage. Like, here's the thing about Sheldon Keith in my mind. He's been a winning coach everywhere he's coached. He's had a good record as a coach. He's done a good job in Toronto. I don't think that's a priority for anyone who's looking to bring in a new GM. I don't think the coach is a priority. Hmm. We only got a few minutes here, Berkey, but I, I just want to touch base because people have uh, often asked me about playing for you. And the one great thing about having you uh, is that, you know, you're, you're watching my back and, and anyone else's who's on the ice. And that's been your, your forte throughout your, your career. Um, you get to Toronto and then it's a different beast, as you just mentioned. And there were times, Berkey, when I watched you and you got into a few battles with a few around, <laughs> either through the media, Toronto Sun, Star, I'm not sure, Hockey Night, but you you, you, you went to battle on a, on a number of occasions, either for your players or for your club. Is there anything that you regretted back then or just felt like, no. you know, no. You, you 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 went too far. It's too big of a beast here. You know how thick is, is no. how thick does your skin have to be to to be a general manager or president in this town? I the the fights that I had with the media were almost always brought on by by someone in the media, and almost always involved one of my players or the team, not me. Like if you read back these horrible criticisms of Brian Burke, I seldom responded to him because I don't care. <laughs> Like, Pat Quinn taught me that. My first year in Vancouver, 1988, Tony Gallagher wrote something that really hurt my feelings. And I was really sour and down about it. And Pat called me in and said, you can't do this job unless you learn to ignore that stuff. So I've never paid any attention to it. But the fights I had were always on behalf of a Phil Kessel or a Dion, and always on behalf of my players or my team. And I'll happily resurrect those again. No regrets that way. I would take back a couple things in my life. One was losing my son, but no one can do anything about that. But as far as the way I ran the team, we probably made some decisions too late. Probably didn't deal with the no trades and the different issues too soon, uh, soon enough. But I'll dissect that in my next book. So, Berkey, I'm guessing you uh, are the rare person who may not have had a problem with Kyle Dubas going at it with the fans in uh, in the first round against Tampa Bay. I wish I'd have been there with him. I'd have been throwing stuff at him. <laughs> I love like, it. You, you guys, you guys, you guys know where that press box is. They're right in your face. Yeah. And everyone thinks Tampa's a mellow audience, and they are mostly. It's a great audience. But they got on me a few times, too. I barked at a few of them. There was some choice language use. <laughs> Boy, I wish we would have had two hours today with you. Um, love love our conversation and uh, ample reason why we got to get you back on the air. Well, I appreciate it. Good talking to you both. Thanks, Berkey. Appreciate your time.